there is the practice, there is the discipline that goes with it, where you have to meditate uh, regularly, a couple times a day. You have to be mindful as you go to sleep, and have your inner sight open. You have to ask, and it's a mindfulness. And then you develop that to where you're being mindful all the time, where you may be even doing a mundane task, like being a doctor in an ER. I mean, mundane to me, because I did so long. But, um, so you can allow that to awaken, and you have to affirm it. But the practice of the technique of meditation and some of these remote viewing um, uh, uh, experimentation exercises very important because is the ex is, this is the exercises you got to do it. And people, oh, Yogananda once said, it's the lack of spiritual adventuresomeness that causes people to not develop. They're just lazy. And he said, use the word lassitude. He's more polite than I am. Um, but he said it was a spiritual lassitude. And people just don't try. They don't do. They don't give it. And, and that's, why, that's why I say in the morning, in the evening, an hour of meditation and, and, and practicing contact with ETs and remote viewing. And if you do that and do it and do it and do it faithfully, it's like any other thing, it will develop. But if you're a dilettante and don't do it and just sort of passively, oh, well, you know, well, then you'll be sitting around being fat and happy eating Cheetos and watching Jay Leno or whoever the that latest talk show moron is. And don't quote me there, but you know, I mean, and, and so the question is what do you want to develop? And if you want it to develop, you have to do it. You have to engage in the time of silence and, and also in the time of engaging the practice. And guess what? Every minute of every day gives you an opportunity to do that. What am I going to say in five minutes? What's going to happen in ten? What's going to happen tonight in the field? The phone rings. Who is it? The next email coming into your Blackberry. What is it? You can do it all the time. You see what I mean? There's an opportunity at every second of every day to develop that faculty of remote sensing and knowing through consciousness. We don't do it because we're not creative. What I'm suggesting is that do it. Now, we're going to go through an exercise where I'm going to take you through a, a series of steps that will assist with that, that you can practice with you know, a friend or your, your significant other, or uh, even by yourself. You have to have some way of objectively checking yourself. And the, the protocol is really a, a first doing the medita uh, sitting and becoming centered. Now, becoming centered may be that you're in a permanent state of that. Most people aren't, but that's cosmic consciousness. But if you're in that it's centered and you wish to be in an intuitive state, you can sit and meditate for a few moments and become quiet and then affirm that your mind is, that you, not only do you see the awake mind and experience that you're awake, but you affirm that it's omnipresent. Oh, so I can see where Emily is right now, Butsy diddling around with Mount Shasta. You see? Why not? And then, so you can do that. And uh, it can be something that you may take 10, 20 minutes to do in, in a protocol. But there are steps to that. And here's where it's very key. If you're sitting and meditate and you become quiet and you wish to do remote view something, an object that, that you don't know what it is and you're, and you're seeing what, what it is, and you go quietly into the state of mind, instead of forcing it through the memory and the monkey mind intellect, become more and more relaxed and allow it to unfold and present itself to you or know what it is. And to do that, it's the same thing with when we're seeing where the ETs are or, or what's in the field. It, 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 it has to be a relaxed state where you're not overriding the objective reality with your intellect. Now, people have asked, what's the difference between imagination and this? There is a place where the imaging, image, image, okay, is in imagination. So there is an imaging component of it, and sometimes you don't know the difference. How do you know the difference? By setting up a series of objective ex um, exercises that test that. I want to hear this. Okay. <laughs> and uh, this is what we're going to do uh, over the next hour or so. And the, the, that is very important. So, for example, 
One of them is the phone ring. Before you answer it, who is it? Now, you don't have 10 minutes to meditate. So we're going to be doing something. I'm going to take up the basket, I guess. Oh, I'm Little Red Riding Hood. No, no, I'm the Big Red Wolf. No, anyway. <laughs> And, you know, I'll put an object in here. And we'll sit in meditation and we'll see what it is. Now, the, the problem is people, the anxiety level goes up. And like, there are no right or wrong answers. It's a process, a process, an iterative process. And what, you, what we're going to do is when we go into the quiet meditative state and then we wish to see what's in the basket, then we allow it to be known. Now, some people will feel it. Some will see it. Some will just be knowing, and some will just get a flash. Other people have, will find it unfold in stages. Why? Because everyone is their individuality is different. This is where the individuation, the the, 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 the where where universality and individuation come together, because the universality of mind is still coming, operating through your individuality, and you have your own emotional, intellectual. Soul. And, and that is something you have to begin to work with and know so you know how it feels. Now, what's beautiful about doing exercises that can be objectively and dispositively proven is that when you're getting an accurate hit, I call it a hit, when you get an accurate perception through remote viewing or remote sensing, it will have a certain feeling or may come to you a certain way. And when you are getting something that where you have then gone off the accurate, you'll begin to learn what that feels like. And you develop your truthometer that way, your truth meter, I call it, or your truthometer, where within your own self there's a feeling. So there will be things that will have happened in my life where I will get, I will see it, it either you're in a dream or a vision or a meditation or just in thought, and I, I know 100% it's going to happen or is happening. Take it to the bank because of the feel, how it came across. But it's because I've practiced this for 30 some years. And there'll be other things that seem you have to be a little agnostic about, you're not sure. And other things, it's just mental flotsam. You know, it's whatever. You ate something that made you think about it. Whatever. So knowing that is something you develop by doing a, an exercise over and over again because if you don't try to do it, you won't know if you're getting something. And it is up doing good to say, go and see what's on the dark side of the moon. Because there's nobody that can put you on a vehicle and show whether what you're seeing is accurate or not. It needs to be something right here that you can actually then say, yeah, I got. Now, what's interesting, as we do this frequently, let's say that if I were to put uh, this inside, and I did this one time, I put this inside something and that group, and it was interesting because oh, people got pink, and then some people, when they saw the pink, they went off to a piece of candy. Then they saw round. Oh, well, people saw an orange. Or people saw the, 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 the stone and made it a, a, a crystal that was like a pyramid, like a natural crystal. So the idea is that, that what you want to do is then deconstruct the remote viewing exercise so that you see where you, what you got that was a component of that and then what aspect of it was the monkey mind, the intellect, the memory, the confabulating part of us, just making it up as you go along, which is fine. Everyone does it because this is, a, this is the process. But as you do that over and over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of times every day, you begin to get a sense of when you're getting something accurate and when you're not, and what it feels like. There's a feeling and a knowingness of when it's accurate. Now, I have to say, doing something where it's a, where a remote viewing uh, exercise like we're about to do, because the, you know what I'm going to put in there, some what I don't even know what I'm going to do yet, is an inanimate object. It is a, have the significance of an ET spacecraft or a being, because what they're doing is that they're actively transmitting through consciousness while we're also inviting them. And so the, act, the, 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 the level of dy the dynamism of it is much greater and the significance of it. Because you're more likely to get something that means something, you know, 
you know, I might not have gotten accurately that the man that came into the ER had a golf ball in his, you know, glove compartment. But I did get that he had a brain tumor because that meant something. It was his life. He would have died within 12 hours because he was herniating his brain stem. So 12 hours, he would have been code blue, BRT. <laughs> and so the thing is, is that, it, you know, when this, this sort of exercise, though, is very good because it helps you develop that, that uh, if you will, that consciousness muscle, the consciousness muscle. Um, just like you have to develop your physical muscles if you want to be a bodybuilder or if you want to be a ballerina or if you want to be a surgeon. There is a skill set, and that's what this is all about. That's what I want to teach you. But the most important thing is to understand and acknowledge the nature of mind, and the steps are these. First, sit quietly and do a meditative technique where you settle down into quiet mind. Then... As you begin to open in the, the intent to know what the object is or what it is you're trying to see, if it's a spacecraft, if it's a CE5 initiative, you want to see what it is. Rather than just forcing it intellectually, overriding with thought, allow yourself to remain quiet and calm and let it come to you because you are omnipresent. You don't have to go anywhere. See what I mean? And just let it be known and ask that it be known to you. And as it unfolds, here's the hard part. Keeping the mind on a, on a, on a leash. Keeping it, keeping it in that steady state of calmness so that you don't start, when you start seeing that it's something round, you don't instantly say, oh, it's a golf ball because it's hard and round when it's this. You see what I'm saying? Which is what the the end of it with the ego and, and the intellect and the memory wants to do. And that's where most people, they'll, they'll start to get it and then they'll go there. But that's okay. This is an exercise, it's a training process. And what you want to do is, is then watch what happened as it went sideways. Um, and then develop the mental clarity to not only know when you're going sideways, but all, Okay, because you have to acknowledge it. But also then how to get back to center and start over again. Very important. So that's why we want to do um, this, this training. And then you do it continuously, all the time. So what I'm talking about now is opening up to the mindful way of living. Mindful state. And, and, and that, then this becomes an unbroken process. Whether you're at work, flying a jet, being in the ER, whatever, you can be in that state. But you have to be mindful to, to try to do it. Why not? Most people just don't because they don't bother because we're habitual. We're, we're, we're creatures of habit. And we are habitually. Now, interestingly, in cultures, they've done studies with the aboriginals with their dream time. And it is their habit to just naturally, you know, do this during dream time and go, when they go to sleep and to see what's going to happen the next day or whatever, or even to communicate. And I know someone who went on a trek. He was actually an intelligence officer with the um, uh, CIA trying to figure out how, how to do this for spy purposes and, and found out that, that, you know, they would be the, on these vast distances in the outback and they would be, and, and you know, he'd say, oh, well, you know, we're going to, at that point, we're going to meet so-and-so. He says, well, how do you know that? He says, well, because we communicated. And I saw it in the dream time. And they'll go through trek and all these trails and this and that. You know, eight hours later, they run into this so-and-so. And the guy's gobsmacked, going, how the hell did this happen? And he said, well, this is, don't you all live this way, too? Of course, he said, no, we pick up a cell phone and call and say, hey, you want to meet at Joe's Bar at the, the you know, whatever, 3 o'clock. So it's just a way of being. So what I'm suggesting is that make this a way of being. Incorporate that into your Western lives. We're habituated, however long we've lived here not to do that, but you can also begin to retrain yourself. Great idea. Why not? Any questions about the process? Now, it is iterative, even during this, this exercise we're going to do, because what we're going to do is after I do an initial meditation, we'll all do a meditation together. We will then go into a state where we will begin to do the remote viewing of whatever we're saying. Back.
after that happens, what we're going to do is stay very quiet and do it. And, and if you find yourself getting distracted with other thoughts or tr overthinking the process, stop the remote viewing and go back to just meditating. Or the mantra or whatever works for you. See what I'm saying? You want to continue to pull back to center, pull back to center, pull back to center, pull back to center, and then see. It's like, you know, the, the, the Sufi master, be as nothing and then walk upon the water. So you have to be in that state of nothing that's quiet and then intend to know. Okay? And that's the, that's the, the, the process. And you keep doing that so that you stay in a, in, a, in a quiet state. And you will find, many people will find that they'll just get it in a flash. Other people will find it will unfold. And many people will find they'll get some component of something or another. There are no right and no wrong answers. This is not, you know, Sesame Street. Uh, you know, it, this is a, a process. And what I want to share is this uh, protocol that I'm describing now and then a practice that you can do with your car team, with your buddy, um, or with your significant other or friends, or your contact <coughs> your back wherever you live, as sort of an exercise. And it's very, very easy to do it because it's just not setting up the time and the situation to do it. But you need to have some way of objectively checking it. Um, and we've already had a lot of that because, of, you know, like this gentleman had seen this dome crack with all this light, and in fact, we had a dome crack around us with the whole sky and the space was looking white with the light last night. And it really was. And sometimes it's not as literalistic as we sometimes see, or sometimes it's more so. But that's what we do with these SETI contact protocols. So doing something with an inanimate object is something that is a, a, a way of sharpening that tool, that skill, so that it's very, very accurate. Now, towards the end of it, there's a post, what I call, you know, it's like the post-game analysis. <laughs> The, the, you know, after the, re, the, the remote viewing exercise, it's equally important to, to see how it is, what you got that was accurate, and what wasn't, and why, what happened. And to really then look at it uh, dispassionately, without just no judgment here at all. Because, I mean, no one knows everything, and the kids do. You know, anyone who's 100% on this is not even the avatars are, frankly. So you, you have to uh, understand that this is something that is something that's how you learn and, and teach yourself to do it accurately. So what you want to be able to do is afterwards say, oh, well, I was getting that, and then my mind leapt to something else. But when I was getting it, it felt like this, or I was in this state. And when I leapt to something else, this is what it felt like. And after you do that a few dozen and a few hundred times, you really do begin to, to have a skill with this. And this is true of anything. The positive feedback is very important, but also knowing where you sort of uh, kind of went off is important. And that's how we learn and become more per expert at being a, uh, a seer or a remote viewer. Does that make sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. So you want to do that? Any questions? Questions, comments, additions? Yes. You want to practice it like, you know, at home? Like, how would you, like, just do it like one day, or could you just have, you know, somebody have the object and, like, do it over a period of days? You know what I mean? Like, well, you can do it a million ways. You can do it. You can do it remotely. I mean, um, uh, Art Bell, uh, there's a show called Coast to Coast, some of you heard, and Art Bell um, had a thing, and one time he had a concept, and he put a something, he put something on his refrigerator, you know, stuck something on his refrigerator with a magnet. Or, and he had a contest. And asked people to be able to see it and know what it was. Oh, they were doing all the stuff with the remote viewing and blah, blah. And a C-SETI guy who was a title examiner who lived in San Diego, who was part of our team with the Bob Hairgrove, called up and said, it's this. And it was exactly it. And Arpel said, how did you? He said, well, I went to a C-SETI training and learned this really simple program. And he had never done any meditation in his life. He won. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so people spend thousands of dollars to film for it. And it's because they don't have a teacher who knows what they're talking about. 
They don't know the Vedas. They don't know consciousness. So it's a waste of time. So, um, so, the, and, and so you can actually do it with a buddy who, who lives in the other side of the country. They do, you know, put something somewhere, do something, let me see, I'm going to sit and see if I can get it in time. Because the, the proximity of it, you know, the fact that the basket is here and I'm going to put it on this table is irrelevant. If, you're, if your physical senses don't see what's in it, it could have just as well be in Singapore. Right? Why? Consciousness is omnipresent. Your mind can travel and be anywhere. You can see any place. You see? So you, you can do this in an infinite number of ways. But you do need to have some way of doing it objectively. It doesn't do any good. I mean, it is important for what we're doing with C SETI to see what's out in deep space and what's going to happen to it. But you need to be able to have a way of checking it if went for, the, for this exercise part of this. Now, you know, you've learned how to meditate. Now you need to learn how to apply the meditative state to this. There's, there's a method to my madness here for those of you who don't you know, think everything has to happen in the first two days to get over it. Um, and and the, here's the other point is that when we're out in the when we're going out to the field, you also want to ask within meditation, what's going to happen tonight? You notice I've asked that if you do that each night. Why? Because by the end of the night, the, it, we're, it's over. And so then what you find is that by the end of the evening, if you're doing this, you can know whether your meditation and your remote view into the future was accurate or not. But the nice thing about real-time exercises like this is that the future, I mean, you got the NRO, you got the DTs and their agenda, are they busy that night? Whatever. There are all these uh, exigency variables. Whereas this is, there it is. And also to do it something that can be confirmed. It doesn't do any good to say what's on the far side of Pluto or whatever, you know, because no one can check that for you. And so if someone can make up anything. Um, and so in terms of being honest and objective about it, you want to have something that can be uh, verified. But you can do that with a friend, a colleague, or, a uh, C-SETI buddy that you stay in touch with, whatever. It can be done remotely or by email or whatever. So, you know, put something somewhere and I'll release it. And, and you can practice doing that every day. It's great. And it's fun. I could see one of the challenges for me would be not to over um, making up this word, word logicalize or, or analyze from knowing the person. You know, like have my mind uh -huh. engage. You know, like oh well, it's probably more, most likely this, or most likely this, or most likely. This. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and that's where the where you want to do the guessing game. And I tell people, and there are remote viewing pr protocols that do sort of a guessing and, and, and a ranking: is it this or is it that? And sort of it's sort of tricking the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. and, and that does work. That's what the Ed Dames and the, the what they call scientific remote viewing and the CIA did, and some of the stuff at the Monroe Institute. The problem with that is that it leaves on the cutting room floor, as it were, the, the faculties of consciousness and higher states of consciousness. And all cities should develop with higher states of consciousness. If they develop asymmetrically, um, they actually are injurious to your overall evolution of your soul. But for example, I mean, the head, the head of Army Intelligence uh, told me that they had taken a whole bunch of their um, young guys um, through uh, the Monroe Institute, and mm -hmm. many of them began to have out-of-body and remote viewing experiences. Uh, most of them committed suicide or became institutionalized or alcoholics. In fact, um, when I got to know David Morehouse, he said the top remote viewers that he knew that had gone through that protocol had either become alcoholic, mentally ill, or had breakdowns or something, because what had happened is that they had developed technologies and techniques that enabled them to do that, but they didn't have an understanding of consciousness, their soul, the cosmology, nothing. And so they developed a city without developing their higher states of consciousness and understanding of mind. And it ended up being highly injurious to them. Uh, and this is not well known in the public. This is not this is the dirty little secret that the, the CIA and the DIA and the Army Intelligence doesn't talk about that I know intimately well. And I told, and he asked me why, and I said, I'll tell you why, because I'm a Vedic scholar and teacher and meditation teacher. You were developing an ability before that, so it was an immature soul in a sense, who did not understand the nature of consciousness, the nature of space-time, and all the cosmology and all the dimensions. 
and you just threw this technique at them, and they forcibly just wanted to have the ability to spy psychically on the Soviet Union or whatever, without any regard to the care of the soul. And for that reason, it developed something asymmetrically. And it made total sense. I said it's non-holistic. And so that's why I, I te- the, the approach I teach is what you, a lot of people don't know when they get the training materials. It's a Vedic-based, consciousness-based application where you develop. And that's why we spent a, the first few days doing these things, prayer and meditation, and then we start doing this. And the reason for it is because I want people to understand consciousness and mind and all this uh, strange things and the cosmology before we start dumping this on. Because these are very powerful techniques. The other thing is that it can be a waste of time. I, and the, the, the great story I love is the Buddha um, came across this guy who had been um, practicing for 30 years how to levitate across this stream that was about, you know, maybe 10 feet wide. And he had developed that city, which is a city. And I know how to do that. I've levitated before. And he levitated, and he could levitate his body and go across the stream and land on the other side, and then he could come back. And he had spent 30 years developing that one city, that one power city. And we defined that several times all week. Some people don't hear it the first time or the tenth time, but S I D V H I, a city, a Vedic power or power within the mind and soul. Well, the Buddha came along, and this guy was very puffed up with pride and was very proud that he'd achieved this. And uh, he said, Oh, Buddha, look, I can levitate across the stream. And he did it. And the Buddha, there was a footbridge. <laughs> so the Buddha walked across the footbridge and said, Oh, yes, but you wasted 30 years. You just could have walked across the stream with the footbridge. You see? How oh, true. How oh, true. So the development of higher states of consciousness and knowledge and wisdom is what's important, not the flash and the bang of these that you wish to uh, master and command. And there's a ruby mind, and a gold mind, and an emerald mind, and a silver mind. Now, there is a fork that controls all that territory. Now, you can foolishly conquer the ruby mind, and the silver mind, and the gold mind, and you can do that. Or you can go and take possession of the fork. And then all the territory comes with it, including the ruby mind, and the silver mind. And when you wish to access the rubies, you access them. When you wish to access the gold, you access it. When you wish to, and, and here, the analogy, the fort, of course, is this state of consciousness, pure consciousness. You see what I mean? And that's what you get in meditation. Of course. I mean, the, the meditative process uh, delivers you to the state of samadhi that he had, will have, and that many of you have had. But then as you go there and stay there and it becomes established within you, these other abilities spontaneously unfold. So like, for example, when I, had, when I levitated, I was on an uh, advanced course for, for meditation teachers, and I was doing about eight hours a day of meditation. And it was in the spring, and I was up near Livingston Manor, New York. And I was in this state of just great bliss, and it was in the spring, and I went out, and I just spontaneously, just from the state of exhilaration, I wasn't trying to do anything. And I lifted up and went from here to like the other side of the, the, the cabin and just floated up maybe three or four feet up. As soon as my monkey mind and ego kicked in, went, oh, how am I doing this? And oh, uh, how cool. Yeah. <laughs> Pop the balloon, you know. So again, leave thyself behind and then walk upon the water. The selfless state, the egoless state of this transcendental aspect of who we are then the experience of that, you then begin to have all these other abilities added, and they unfold spontaneously. So this is why I like to just, you know, introduce people to what we're doing with C-Study, the consciousness aspects of it, the puja, the meditation, and the then this, not the other way around. Because if you develop consciousness, I mean, we're only here for, you know, less than a week, but if you understand that conscious mind and the experience of the meditative state going into this quiet state of enlightenment, 
that within that are all the, 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 the silver mine and the gold mine, all the cities, whether it's dematerialization, levitation, remote viewing, precognition, uh, astral projection, all that is folded within the faculty and the capacity of the mind to experience itself, just silent, the mind experiencing itself. It's very beautiful. So that's the approach I take, rather than taking a bunch of people and doing things and cramming that, and then they asymmetrically develop. I'd rather have people, by asymmetric in, in an aberrant way, develop holistically. And I think it's a wiser approach, a safer approach, than what Army Intelligence and CIA were doing with all these guys. And I know I, I'm friends with Ingo Swan and all these guys, and we, we just compared notes. And anyway, I do, I do what I think is the highest and best approach to this. And that's why um, the focus the focus for me is always on consciousness and the development of higher states of consciousness. And then from that, uh, and then there is the, the, the techniques within that, which is what I was just describing. Of after you do that, you know, going through the process and, and seeing and letting it unfold. And But you have to first affirm that the mind is omnipresent, affirm that it's eternal, and that, it, that that is your true nature of your soul. And you go, yeah, I am. That is me. Boom. So then you just, once you affirm it, that positive energy and opens that channel, and then you can see anything. It's amazing what you can do once you know you can do it. And if you don't think you can do it, you'll never do it. As ye have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. It's an old expression, but it's very true. Um, faith in this sense, not catechisms of belief so much as an act of knowing of things not yet seen. You have to know you can do it. And that's how we do everything that evolves. How we evolve. You have to have that hope. And you have to have that faith. And you have to have that knowledge. Right? Okay. It's a nice deep cleansing breath. In the Go through the window of our own 
soul, the ray of this infinite light. We arrive at the central sun of our soul, this quiet place. We know that it is always with us. But the conscious mind whereby we are awake never be divided. There is always one light of mind whereby we are each illuminated and awake. Meaning this aspect of the awake mind, all thought, all sounds, all feelings, perception of our individuality. All of this, all that exists in the relative existence, are like waves come and go the surface of a vast ocean. Yet in reality, it is all the essence of the water of the ocean. always is one with the ocean of cosmic mind. We dive to this calm and deep ocean of mind, silent, pure. Will we find ourselves calm and quiet? gazing at all the waves of perceptions of this silent place, the unbounded ocean of mind. Hold that this vast ocean, whereby we each exist, is so peaceful, infinite, bound. nature of the mind whereby we are awake at this instant. Let us dive more deeply into the heart of this silence, knowing that it is omnipresent and eternal, present in its fullness at every point in space and time. That is the true nature of our own innermost soul. We're all one together. And all the waves become one. Silent. Quiet. Deep peace. I was aware of the true nature of mind see that the awake mind whereby we are conscious is the vast ocean. It's ever separate. So, with our will, our intent, we see inside the vast an object. We know it. See it. Feel it. However way we gain knowledge, allow it to unfold from this deep and silent place of consciousness. All the individual spokes of our individualities join together in this hub of life, a pure mind gaze inside the basket and behold what is there. We come to you without effort. Easy, spontaneous. Like a dream comes. And as you see it, let it unfold further. 
about the intellect and the memory guessing. And if at any point you become distracted or strained, return to the meditation. In silence, and you may use the mantra or watch the breath and dive into this vast ocean of silent mind. And from being centered in that reality, the true nature of unbounded being, then perceive the object within the basket. We silent for a few minutes. Or we meditate and remove view the object. sharing your impressions. Check in with your own truth meter and accuracy and feel if it's accurate or not and return to gazing with your consciousness inside the basket and seeing the object. Because you have to give the effort to it. You have to think of how to do it. And there are a million ways to do it. 